Hello, my friends, maintain your composture. We're here for you on the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervilla, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson, coming to you from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Stacy, uh, today we talk about the art of enjoying your garden. And I always say, if you want to enjoy a garden, push the envelope. Push the envelope. Try some plants that maybe you didn't think you could grow. Have some fun with it. And bear in mind that experienced gardeners, according to surveys that I've looked at, state that over the course of their lifetime, they've killed about 30% of the plants they've tried to grow. That's where the number's at. 30% amateurs? My goodness. <laughs> I mean, I guess as a whole of all the plants I've ever tried, 50% would seem a little high. So yeah, maybe yeah. like somewhere in the, the third range would yeah. be appropriate. Right in that ballpark. So don't be afraid to push the envelope. Stop looking at gardening as a hobby. It's a lifestyle. It's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I think Instagram helped us uh, do that. So do that. And in the art of enjoying your garden and plants, one of the things that's high on my list, Stacy, is to rescue some plants. There's no greater feeling than rescuing a plant from the edge of death or buying a plant from a bargain bin and then having it look beautiful next year. Would you agree? I get it. I do get it. Now, I don't get this. I don't get the same thrill. I know that there are a <laughs> lot of people who do, and I totally respect that. Um, but I, you know, I guess I just don't have that like nurturing instinct for plants. I'm a little bit more of a like, all right, I've read about you. You seem like you're going to do what I want. Now do it or you die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, that was a little bit overly brutal, but um, there is value in that, though, because if you can rescue something, that means that it can, can come back from the brink if you do have really dramatic uh, conditions like tear damage or, you know, mm -hmm. heavy drought like we often have here or, you know, in our dry soils. Um, so it's a good test, but I, I'm... I'm not the person who scours the bargain area for plants that are on death doorstep and then gets excited about rescuing well, them. I get that, though. I do get that people love that. I don't necessarily go to the bargain area either. I dumpster dive. <laughs> you and my neighbor. My neighbor actually rescued a beautiful paper bark maple from a dumpster at a garden center, and it is looking fabulous oh, yeah. now. And I congratulated him heartily for doing that. <laughs> Hey, plant things uh, that you can see from inside the house during uh, inclement weather. Oh my gosh, this is so important and so something that people really don't think about until it's too late. And then it's winter and they're looking at nothing and they say, oh, you know, when I got that new Rosa Sharon, I really should have planted it outside this window so I could be looking at some birds or something right now. You bet. Another item in the art of enjoying your garden, automate your watering. Oh my goodness. You said a mouthful there. Mm-hmm. Because like, it's simple? a chore. Why oh. why do it yourself when you can have a, a machine, as it were, do it for you? Size your garden for the resources that you have and embrace container gardening. I think that's an element in the art of enjoying your garden. You know, container gardening, um, It's I've always done it. You know, I sort of came of my gardening age at the height of container gardening when it was really having just its zenith of people doing mixed containers and tropicals and all of that. So to me, they're really important. And um, the way that I have them this year is they've really kind of shaped my patio. So we have very little seating space, which sounds like a bad thing, except it's a good thing because we're completely surrounded by plants that hummingbirds mm. love. Yeah. And they're going bananas out there. There are times where we don't necessarily feel safe because they're so active and so loud and so aggressive. Oh, unreal. And just having in that moment, just being surrounded, you know, it's a lot more work to do that in the ground and to dig up the grass and to make new beds. But with containers, you can shape the space any way you want. And that is a really freeing and amazing thing. I agree 100%. I plant up containers of flowers. I brought this for our YouTube viewers and for, I have it tied up in my microphone here. Here we go. Uh, Ooh, I cut those so uh, out of containers in my landscape, but that's uh, Truffula Pink Gumpfrina and Meteor Shower Verbena 
And those two plant them near my Miss Molly and Miss Violet Ooh. Buglias, and the butterflies and hummingbirds go absolutely bonkers. Well, not to mention, it's an amazing color combination. Yeah. I love this, these colors. They're really beautiful. But if there are stakes holding up the verbena, because it gets pretty tall, mm -hmm. the hummingbirds love to perch on the top Aww. of the stakes, and that gives them a vantage point so when competition comes in, right? Oh, yeah. They are they get busy. They, they do not tolerate uh, anyone moving in on their turf. They, it's, it's, just, it's wild because they sit only to chase something off. Exactly. And then they have to refuel because yep. they spent so much energy chasing uh, this poor fellow hummingbird off. And it's like, geez, if you guys would just share, I think you would all enjoy my garden a lot more. But, you know, I'm, I'm we're watching like the midair battles, the ninja yes. battles up in the air. It's such an incredible time to be out there and enjoy the garden. A blast to watch. And it's all part of the art of enjoying your garden. Other items to do. Buy good tools. Good tools, not cheap tools. And have plenty of them. And evaluate your clothing. Bad clothing in the garden is awful. Are they too tight? Are your pants too tight? Or are they falling down? Uh, as a runner, of course, I like wicking type clothes. And I think it's perfect for in the garden. So wear good garden clothes, which by the way, I noticed jorts are coming back. <laughs> <laughs> jeans that are like you know cut off uh, oh, yeah. just above jorts oh, i'm not wearing that in the garden <laughs> too uh, close to your neighbors <laughs> <laughs> my word of the day on today's program is a verb it's called procrastiplanting pro uh, here it comes procrastiplanting it's when you have a million things to do but you ignore them all and tend to your plants instead oh that's yeah that's valid. You know, and, and that is a more timely thing. Your house can be cleaned anytime. Yeah. The planting season, the gardening season is short. So you need to know how to prioritize your time and, you know, make hay as well the sun shines, as they say. I agree. Uh, gardening's great exercise. That's how you enjoy your garden. Think of it this way. You don't have to pay for a gym membership. You don't have to get in your car and drive to a gym. That's another way to enjoy your garden. Here comes a limerick, Stacy. I created beauty with flowers at my chateau, then wander the garden with an espresso. Life is good in my neighborhood. Just call me Vincent Van Gro. Ah, yeah, that's cute. That's how I feel. Grow plants for other people and share the knowledge. Mix in plants that need minimal attention. And Stacy, I know you're big into this. Fall plant some garlic. Talk oh, yeah. about minimal attention, right? Definitely. Yeah. And I that mean, helps us enjoy Minimal it. attention, maximum benefit. You got it. Incorporate plants that have three to four seasons of interest. Have paths and seeding in your garden. And, uh, of course, seeding gives you license to nap in your garden or your outdoor room. Work in bite-sized pieces so you don't get discouraged and grow what you love and grow stuff you can eat. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I think along those lines, it's important to know when to stop, know when to take a break. Like if you're getting frustrated and you're getting overwhelmed and you're getting sweaty and it's not fun anymore, that is your cue that, you know what, it might be time to, <laughs> to take a shower and, and get out of the garden for a little while. Because I think people just feel so much like, oh, I've got to do this all. I think the bite-sized chunks is a great uh, yeah. way to, to think about it, you know, some, especially if you have like a lot of weeds, you don't need to just sit there and feel completely overwhelmed. Just say, okay, you know what? I'm going to do two square feet right now. Mm -hmm. And if I want to do two more square feet when I'm done, I will. And if I don't, I'm going to make dinner. Whatever. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Of course, we already touched on this plant, uh, plant for pollinators and birds, but essentially the point here is, and that's why I brought along the truffula pink gomfrina and the verbena, uh, because the butterflies uh, absolutely love it. But we also want to attract birds to our garden uh, because they add life and color to the garden 365 days out of the year. Yeah, and, you know, right now we think of, you know, maybe sparrows as not that interesting, but in the winter we're pretty grateful for them, and they're very fun to watch. And if you don't give them habitat, then they'll go somewhere else. You've got it. So... Probably one of the most rewarding parts of gardening is creating a garden where you actually want to be outside and off your digital devices. 
And that's what we're going to try to do for you here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Plants on Trial is coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. You know, Rick, one of the reasons I was thinking about this topic for today's show about enjoying the art of enjoying the garden is a saying that a former boss of mine had that he actually got it from a friend of his. And that is the measure of a good garden is how many places it has where you want to sit down and have a drink. I like that. And like Adriana's counting on her fingers right right now. And it doesn't matter what you drink, whether that's coffee or nice water or the beverage of your choice. But, um, you know, I think that that is so important. It's been something that, you know, as I have worked on my garden, something that I've kept in mind is a garden is, yes, it's work and you have to put effort into it. But it's also about sitting there and enjoying it. And the more places that you create in your garden to sit and enjoy it, uh, I think the more ideas you get, the more perspective you get on it. And um, it's just a really useful way of kind of shaping the space. Uh, And it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't mean you like have acres of gardens in these fancy garden rooms. I mean, I live on a quarter acre and we have one, two, three, four, five different sitting areas that involve the outdoors or the garden somehow. So that's my tip. And I personally have come to a point now where I'm totally okay to just be like, okay, I'm done gardening. I'm going to sit now. But I know some people aren't like that. But it is important, I think, to give your self-permission to enjoy it. And even if you do truly enjoy the work and the effort, and I do love a good day weeding in the herb garden when you're in there and the pollinators are all around you and it smells amazing. Like, I love that. But um, I love sitting in it and watching it just as much. So I'm glad you brought it up because coming up today on Branching News, we'll talk about some of the places where you've taken a nap. Oh. A survey. (laughs) So stay tuned for branching news. So if you work hard enough in the garden, (laughs) it might qualify. Well, anyway, uh, going on the theme of enjoying your garden and the art of enjoying your garden, I picked a plant on trial today. Uh, It's one that you can enjoy because it's so easy to care for. You really don't have to do anything. And I think when we have plants in our garden that maybe need deadheading or need supplemental water when you aren't really into, you know, normally watering the rest of your garden or, you know, Maybe you need to manage um, the seed set, which I do on a number of my plants because we talked about self-sowers a few weeks ago and those are a little aggressive. So things I don't want to grow more, I'll just go out there and sometimes it breaks my heart because the seed heads do look really good, but I need to control and make sure they don't spread too much. Um, But you, every gardener, Uh, or even if you're not a gardener and you just consider yourself someone who has plants in your yard, a a landscape, needs a plant that you really don't have to lift a finger to enjoy. Yes. And the plant that I have chosen to represent this concept is Gatsby Gal oak leaf hydrangea. Great choice. I mean, I love oak leaf hydrangeas. Uh, Who doesn't love oak leaf? I've really never run into anybody. And if you're out there, forgive me, you can write us and tell us why you don't like (laughs) oak leaf hydrangeas. But I have yet to run into anybody who's like, eh, oak leaf hydrangeas, don't really like them that much. Well, like we were talking about in the first segment, Stacey, the reason I love oak leaf hydrangeas so much is because they give you four seasons of interest. I mean, great foliage in summer, the beautiful blooms, the fall color is knock your socks off, cinnamon exfoliating type bark in winter. Four seasons of interest. And, you know, that's really saying something for a hydrangea. Because the majority of hydrangeas, winter is not their strong suit. They're sticks. (laughs) They're worse than sticks. They look like sticks, and they're begging you to cut them back. And you know it's going to be bad, but they just look like they should be cut back. And that doesn't happen with oak leaf hydrangeas. You know, I think you spelled it out exactly, Rick. The the oak-shaped foliage comes out in spring, and it has this white fuzzy coating on it that just is really interesting and engaging makes you want to touch it like we're yep. our touching your plants episode yep. and then in summer of course you get those panicle ice cream cone shaped flowers if you have something like gatsby pink which we covered as a plant on trial on a previous show those are going to turn pink later in the season amazing fall color and not that many other hydrangeas get great fall color and then not only does it have this beautiful uh, deep rich brown peeling bark but they take on a very interesting and sculptural shape mm-hmm. um you know they're not just like a little bundle of sticks sticking out they they 
they get kind of um, artsy. And you can even, they don't need pruning, and I recommend that you don't prune oak leaf hydrangeas. But if you do want to get out there and get artsy, you can certainly take off a limb here and there to impose or develop uh, the habit that you want. So it is more artistic and it is um, doing what you want it to do in the garden. So I do love that. Like I said, it doesn't need pruning. And compared to other hydrangeas that bloom on old wood, uh, like oak leaf hydrangeas. So these are hydrangeas that right now in September are making their flower buds for next year. Okay. So on the old wood, next year that wood will be old. Um, you know, those people get really confused about those. And other types of old wood blooming hydrangeas like big leaf hydrangea, a lot of times they get weather damage. Oak leaf hydrangea has no such issue. If you are growing it within its hardiness range, which is USDA zones five through nine, you do not need to worry about winter weather or spring frost impacting the flowers. They actually have just a naturally better uh, tolerance of their flower buds to cold weather. So you, you don't have all of these little, should I prune it? Shouldn't I prune it? Why didn't it flower? Was it the weather? Was it me? Was it deer? Um, although it could be deer. I will say, <laughs> I will say that uh, they are not deer proof or even deer resistant, although they're somewhat deer, more deer resistant than like smooth or, or panicle hydrangeas. Um, so you really don't have to lift a finger. Once you get this thing established, it just looks, it's around and looks beautiful all year round. And I love that pruning uh, aspect. It, it makes it easy. If you're keeping score at home, you want to use the search engine of your choice to check it out. Gatsby Gal Oak Leaf Hydrangea is today's uh, plant on trial. Um, that pruning aspect really is a game changer in convincing people to try this plant. Right, and Gatsby Gal does it all one better because it's a semi-dwarf variety of panic of oak leaf hydrangea. So um, most oak leaf hydrangeas, got to warn you, they are going to get big, real big. And if you have ever, this is actually a North American native species. I don't know if a lot of people realize that, but it grows abundantly um, through the southeast and even into the south, which is accounts for that zone nine heat tolerance that I mentioned. Out in the wild, they get huge. You'll see them 10 or more feet tall. Um, and it takes time for them to get there, but they will get there. So that, depending on your garden and your space, might not make it so low maintenance if you have a 10-foot behemoth of a hydrangea, whereas Gatsby Gal is going to tap out at a nice 5 to 6-foot height and width. And that makes it a good kind of back of the border plant in your landscape. It makes it a great plant to intermix with your native perennials, which is what I do. And it works really well because I have so many large scale native perennials. Um, and that size really, you don't have to worry so much about, is it going to overgrow? Is it going to, you know, again, become this thing that just outcompetes everything else in my landscape. So even though all everything that we're talking about does apply to all oak leaf hydrangeas, I think Gatsby Gal oak leaf hydrangea is a particularly good example of this art of enjoying your garden because it's going to need you're going to need to worry about it even less. It's not going to outgrow its space. So a couple questions for you, Stacy. One is with oak leaf hydrangea, do we want to grow it in sun or shade? And the other question is, I think I've heard you mention before that Gatsby Gal is great for pollinators. Am I wrong about that? I mean, is the flower kind of have any kind of scent? Uh, so it, oak leaf hydrangeas do have a bit of fragrance. I mean, I yeah. certainly wouldn't consider them one of those things that you walk by and go, whoa, what was that? Right, right. Um, but they do have like a light honey fragrance. And Gatsby Gal is a lace cap hydrangea. So but basically what that means is that the fertile florets where all the business is, the, the pollen and the nectar, uh, they're, they outnumber the showier or papery sterile florets. And that's, so it's the fertile florets that the pollinators are after. And if there's too many of those sterile florets, they can't see them. They know the pollen's down there, but they can't get to it. So as a lace cap, when you can see more of those fertile florets, it is more appealing uh, to pollinators, um, even if you don't actually uh, get the fragrance on it. And uh, what was your other Sun question? Sun or shade. Sun or shade. Oh, perfect. Yes. I do often tell people that Gatsby Gal or Oakleaf hydrangeas in general are the most shade tolerant hydrangeas. And that is to say that they will mostly do what you expect them to do in shade. Now, what you will see is probably a little bit fewer flowers than you would see if they get at least some sun. So part sun would be ideal. I do grow mine in full sun. They're well established, so they're fine. Um, and especially the fall color and oak leaf hydrangeas get beautiful fall color, uh, just a deep, rich burgundy. Yeah, love it. In too much shade, that's going to be kind of a muddier color. It's still going to be effective, sure. but it's just not going to have like the the 
the brightness to it because it just, you know, is not metabolizing as quickly. So, um, but if you do have deep shade, I think this is a great choice. Um, and it's really just such a beautiful hydrangea. And the fact that it's native, I think is, you know, makes it an even bigger winner in my book. Perfect leaves on this plant. If you have kids who need to make a leaf collection for school. <laughs> As long as they don't misidentify them as an oak. Right. Because they do indeed resemble an oak, but but supersized. Uh, so that was a lot. And there's so much to say about this beautiful plant and oak leaf hydrangeas in general. So please visit Gardening Simplified on air.com or our Instagram page at The Gardening Simplified Show. And you will get all the details there. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're opening up that gardening mailbag. So stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Boy, the questions are coming in. You know, I feel like at the beginning of the season in spring, there's a lot of questions. People are like, what do I do in spring? And you get a little bit of a lull in summer. People, of course, are asking about hydrangeas because that never ends. And then in fall, things start ramping back up as people are like, how do I winterize this? What should I do about this? Can I plant this? And the answer, first of all, to the, can I plant this is it is still a great time to you plant. Mm -hmm. Such a good time to plant. Here in Michigan, you can easily plant safely through at least mid-October, sometimes even late October. The general guideline is you want to get that stuff in the ground six weeks before the ground freezes, which, of course, you can never predict when that happens. But usually for us, it's at least into December. So um, if you're out there and you're seeing those bargains, don't be afraid to scoop them up and get that stuff in the ground. I love it. All part of the art of gardening. Get yourself a fall bargain. Right? Yes. All right. Uh, Jennifer wrote to us, uh, Stacy, commenting on the YouTube bonus episode. Do you guys steer away from using gravel in flower beds? Can you touch base on using it? I don't want to use landscape fabric because people say it's bad for plants. I have boxwoods in this flower bed. I want to put in gravel. It's mostly shady, stays mostly moist. Well, I am glad that Jennifer mentioned landscape fabric because I cannot abide by landscape fabric. And I have to tell you. That in, means you don't like it? That means I do not like it. <laughs> uh, in 12 years, over 12 years of answering people's garden questions, and particularly when it comes to hydrangeas, probably the main reason I've seen hydrangeas die is landscape fabric. Mm. Because first of all, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It does not really keep down weeds. Um, so it will keep down like some of the surface weeds, which would have been easy to remove anyway, but some of the, the deeper ones, they'll just go right through that. They don't care. Um, and it often uh, interferes with water. You know, if it will hold too much moisture in the soil and interfere with gas exchange, so there's not a lot of oxygen getting to the roots. And if your soil's dry, it will interfere with water infiltrating into your soil and keeping it sufficiently moist. And I find that this effect is exacerbated or worsened uh, when it's combined with gravel. Those like mm. gra the gravel landscape fabric combo for many plants, not all plants, but many plants, it's a lethal combination. Mm. Um, but my overall feeling about gravel in beds is it's kind of a personal taste. Um, it's expensive, it's hard to spread, but if you do prefer the look of it, I think it's okay for most plants as long as they are heat tolerant. Um, you know, it does trap and hold a lot more heat than an organic mulch will. And of course it's not enriching the soil like an organic mulch will. Um, but it is fine for, you know, things like conifers I've seen, you know, very successfully planted in, in gravel beds. Of course, if you're doing a rock garden or you have like a, suc a you know, hardy succulent garden or something like that, it can be effective. Um, but I don't know. What do you think? Well, I ran a garden center for many decades. And so in regards to the landscape fabric comment, I would say no comment because <laughs> I sold it for years. Oh yeah. Well people, I mean, you can't talk people out of it, but they I don't really have use to, it. I don't use it. They have to find out on their own. Right. I you know, my friend it. has a saying, you can't tell anybody anything. And it's so true. <laughs> they do have to find out for themselves. And, and it seems like it makes sense. It yeah. seems like landscape fabric would be effective. It's just that the real world practice is not. But using gravel as a mulch, uh, do not like it. I, I just don't like it. Um, That's fair. It, it, I, I think it raises the temperature. It's hard to maintain. All kinds of debris falls into the cracks and yeah. crevices. It really doesn't have organic value. Mulch helps cool the roots. It helps retain some moisture. Gravel rocks really do not do that. So not a big rock fan. All right. I like sense. rock and roll, but rocks <laughs> in the landscape, not really. And you know what? I really can't stand when they get in your shoe. 
Oh, that that's, too. That's, that's the, the worst. worst. That's but, the worst. So really, ultimately, Jennifer, what we're saying is, yes, stay away from the landscape fabric. Great idea. If you like the gravel, then you like it, and that's okay. Do be aware that it will raise the temperature around the plants. You said you're planting boxwood in it. That should be okay. Definitely, I do not recommend rocks around hydrangeas. I have seen a lot of very, very unhappy hydrangeas. Even this week, hearing from home gardeners who are unhappy with their hydrangea and saying what's wrong, and then they send me a picture, and it's a you know, pinky winky surrounded by rocks. So, um, you know, we can't, we can't tell people what they like. It's my, that's a personal choice. My sediments. Exactly. <laughs> Don't take it for granted. Right. <laughs> good one. DD writes, what's the best way to remove annuals in the fall? I love this question. Such a good one. Is it best to just cut them back and leave the roots or pull the whole plant out? Do old roots add anything to the soil? I'm passionate about this question. Okay, well, proceed. you. I want to hear what you have to say then. <laughs> I'm not so passionate. I mean, I have my opinion, but. I like to pick out the self-sowers and let them uh, go to bloom and dry so they drop their seeds to the soil. So I leaf them alone. Uh, as far as the other annuals are concerned, I like to compost the tops. And I like to dig up the roots and turn them over and use them in the soil. Again, potting soil and soil is expensive. Yes, definitely. And so I keep the roots and just let them decay in the soil. Yeah, it, so it's it's a great point because roots are organic matter. And yes, they will decay over winter as, you know, water and temperature and everything kind of takes their effect. Now, you're not going to see them, you know, go down to nothing over just a single winter, but they absolutely do add organic matter to the soil. I don't like to lose soil, whether it's my actual soil or potting mix, um, because that's just erosion. You're getting rid of the good stuff. So I do leave mostly my summer annuals that have been planted all season. If I have them in the ground, I'll just leave them. I'll just cut them off. Or if, you know, if it's something like a begonia, that's obviously just going to melt away anyway. With my container plants, I try to get as much soil off of them as I can. And then okay. I will just compost the root mass, but I'm saving my potting mix. So, you know, I don't want, if I have, like, I have huge root masses in there, it's hard to refill my containers next season. Um, so I like it, but I do find that if you have fall planted stuff, mums, ornamental cabbages, all of that, that usually pretty much just pops out of the ground. It sure. hasn't been in the ground long enough to actually root in. Sure. And so those I would usually just pop out and throw away. At the greenhouse that I work at, um, at the end of summer, there are annuals that didn't sell. And so they're dumped out into a big pile because it's a lot of plants. They save the plastic pots, but all of these plants, soil intact, uh, is put in a big pile and people buy it. it oh. It's a bulk product, $15 a yard. Wow, that's... Use it as a filler. So. Sure, I like it. Yeah. That's so. using your noggin. I say use it. D -D. I do too. All right, Anita asks, my neighbor across the street and I are having trouble with wasp yellow jacket type bees. They're very friendly this year. They come every time we have a picnic, food outside. They seem to like yard guard spray, and they landed on my neighbor's arm and stung her. So recently we purchased a bee trap that works. This is the first fall they've been a nuisance. Any suggestions? Thank you for your help. Be safe. Yeah. Thank you, Anita. Anita went for the, the bee pun because she knew who she was asking here. Appreciate that, Anita. So, you know, this is a question. So it's it's stingy yellow yellow stripey thing season. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And I say that because there are so many different things that are out there. There's yellow jackets, there's wasps, uh, you know, there's all these different things. And it's so important to understand what you're dealing with, identify what you're dealing with before you can take an approach to managing it. I think a trap is a great all purpose way. Now, some of the traps will have a lure for a specific type of insect, like a yellow jacket trap might not work on a wasp or might not work on a hornet. Um, but we're going to post some links and about how you can identify which stingy yellow stripey thing that you have. And as well as some management tips, because they all have slightly different nesting habits. They all have different things that are going to attract them to your yard. And really this is just an IPM. We've talked about IPM on the show before integrated pest management approach, identifying your problem, know your enemy as it were, and then create your plan of attack. So it's really hard to just give general advice. Some of them like rotting logs, some of them are going to root, uh, you know, nest in the ground and there's really nothing you can do about that to deter them because that's just what they do. So um, it's so important to find out they can. Now, this does not mean you have to, you know, actually capture one and look at it, you know, under a magnifying glass. 
there are a lot of different um, cues from where they're nesting. If they're making one of those little papery nests hanging from your garage, you've just speaking from experience here or coming from the ground or whatever. So we're going to put the resources on the website. Yeah, and at this time of the year, they're looking for sugar and carbohydrates. So there are less blooms than there are in spring and summer. That's why they're hanging around your picnic food, your trash can, your soda cans, uh, the plastic cup that you have on the table. They are looking for sugar and carbohydrates. I say coexist. That's what I do. They generally leave me alone and uh, they're kind of fun to watch. And soon it'll all be over. Like you say, they dodge into the leaf litter or whatever it well, may be. Now yeah, that's I, my approach. No, that's, I, I, I think you're right. And the other thing is most of the species that you're talking about actually only live one season. They don't live yeah. over winter. So it's not like, okay, I have to worry this guy's going to be back next year. They basically die at the end of the season. But again, this is all about trying to identify your pest and doing the research. We'll put those resources at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we've got branching news, so you won't want to miss it. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news, not breaking news. Well, it's somewhat breaking. It's also branching, and we don't make this stuff up. Here's a survey that I took a look at where people have taken a nap. Are there any unusual places you've taken a nap? And I bring this up because the survey did not include a garden. And that really surprised me because I think that's the best place in the world to take a nap. I love uh, if I have a patch of ornamental grasses to lay on your back right in a patch of ornamental grasses as they sway back and forth. Great place to take a nap. That does sound lovely as long as you don't have to worry about ticks. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> It's that very would disruptive. <laughs> tick me off. Um, so uh, here you go. Uh, let's see. A friend's home was number one. Uh, my vehicle, public transportation. I think we've all done that. The beach, movie theater, cafe or restaurant, library, park, doctor's office, pool, corporate office museum or art gallery or a store who takes a nap in a store well like you know you've seen it before when someone's waiting for someone else trying on clothes and they just kind of nod off but i want to go back to movie theater because if you're sleeping in a movie theater you are not napping you are sleeping through the movie <laughs> to see. i've slept through some movies i mean i sleep through movies all the time I don't get me wrong but, <laughs> but you know that i would not call that a nap i would say that uh you know not getting your money's worth. And I've always wondered how bats can nap upside down. Isn't mm -hmm. that something? That is something. They are amazing creatures. I suppose if you do it long enough, you can get the hang of it, right? Yes. Right. Here's one for branching news. This really caught me by surprise. And I'm not trying to be funny here. I read a website that recommends throwing a, uh, let's see, what was the website? It was some kind of, oh, House Digest. Dot com And we'll put the link on our website. It suggests throwing a clove of garlic in your toilet. The concept is surprisingly simple. All you need to do is take a single clove of garlic, drop it in your toilet bowl before going to bed, and as you sleep, the garlic releases its natural aroma, which comes from something called allicin, known for its antibacterial and antifungal properties. These compounds work to neutralize the odors I'm sorry, I had never heard of throwing garlic in your toilet. It seems like a waste of garlic. It seems like a stretch here. This this whole thing is seems like someone just trying to, you know, create an idea that's not harmful, that sounds beneficial, but actually isn't. And like also unless you're um crushing the garlic, I don't see how it's gonna Yeah. Yeah, I don't I I don't know if I buy it. I think I might have seen some things from this website before that have also seemed very dubious. So I don't know. Garlic just putting it out there. I mean, garlic's nature. Uh, garlic uh, in nature is is nature's way of saying surprise. You know, but to find it in your toilet, I don't want you know friends coming over and seeing garlic. <laughs> Floating in my, my toilet, Would it float? I'd, I'd be flushed with embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> I, this just doesn't make sense to me. But people are seeing this and seeing this in social social media. So I got to bring it up as part of branching. Right. News. Well, I think this feels like one of those things that people pretend work so they can feel like they're clever. Oh, 
but I don't know that it actually no, does. Not, if anyone has any any evidence, I would be most interested to hear it. Not clever. Clover. Clove. Because <laughs> it's a clove of garlic. Oh, that was a stretch. Let's move on. The squirrels <laughs> are excited. It's almost Halloween. They go nuts in October. It's pumpkin eating time. And uh, we're going to put, uh, I found this article really interesting, and it's from a website I really like, Garden Design, mm. gardendesign.com. And uh, they, they have a pretty extensive list on how to deal with squirrels because squirrels are busy gnawing on things uh, from uh, the gas hoses on grills. I had a squirrel last year that ate my patio umbrella. Well, didn't eat it, just chewed on it and tore it to shreds. I had to dump the thing. Uh, and then, of course, when you set out pumpkins, yeah, I mean, party that's time. fair game. It's yep. party time, right? And I have seen everything from red pepper flakes to cayenne pepper sprays, Vaseline, Ew. Vicks Vapo Rub, hairspray, hairspray. Um, you remember Aquanet? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. What else would you use? That's like the cheapest hairspray. <laughs> of course you'd use Aquanet. <laughs> you can still find it in the dollar store. You can. Uh, vinegar, uh, garlic, again, on the list, WD-40, peppermint oil, acrylic finish sprays, floor wax. That's interesting. And, of course, some people are just avoiding carving at all and just painting and decorating the pumpkins. Right. I mean, I just don't see how you can put out a – tasty sweet edible fruit in october and not expect right. the local wildlife to avail itself of this marvelous treat you've provided for it i mean it's just the way things go trick or treat <laughs> and when they take a bite out of it you're going to need a pumpkin patch to fix it hey poison ivy is poised to be one of the big winners in global warming according to this article uh, pretty interesting. Scientists expect the dreaded three-leaf vine will take full advantage of warmer temperatures and uh, grow faster and bigger and become even more toxic. So this Oof. is in the news. That's terrible. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, poison ivy definitely gets a lot more uh, stronger in hot, dry conditions. So if rainfall is scarce, if it's hotter, longer that's going to be much more, uh, you know, aggressive. The, the concentration of the oil will be much higher. Yeah, and of course, uh, this is the time of year in fall when it's easy to identify poison ivy. I mean, the fall color is really, really beautiful. And it's at that point in some areas and some wooded areas where you can see the extent of uh, the existence of poison ivy. In right. And just because you see red vines, though, does not mean it's all poison ivy because we, there are a number of other, like Virginia creeper, uh, that also turn red. But yeah. it, is, it is a good way to try to pick it out of your landscape. Do you want to know something interesting about poison ivy? Yes, please. So the substance, the irritating substance in poison ivy is known as arushiol, arushiol. And that comes from the Japanese word for lacquer because they would mix a some sort of you know, distill it of the poison ivy leaves with gold leaf when they were decorating temples so that the gold leaf would not get stolen. Wow. That's interesting. So that's where the name Arushiol comes from is Arushi is the Japanese word for lacquer. That's fantastic. So Did not there's the thing you know. Folks, that's the kind of stuff you learn here <laughs> on the Gardening Simplified show. I like that. No, that's very interesting. Uh, these are experts who have studied poison ivy for decades and uh, warn that there are likely to be implications for human health. I'm glad they're not making a rash decision here. They've studied this for decades. So, Wow, imagine hmm. being a poison ivy scientist. Yes. Grateful for their work, but I can only imagine that it would not be a fun one. No, no. Don't use, uh, you know, we always say eat more plants. Don't use poison ivy in your food because then you'll be cooking from scratch. Did you like that one? You would yeah. probably die if you cooked with poison ivy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you would, would <laughs> almost certainly die. It it's that potent. Set up for a bad joke. <laughs> Adriana liked that one. Please do not <laughs> eat. You know what? If you have it in your yard, just just get out there and cut it down and get rid of it as quickly as you can. I agree. Uh, finally, the BBC reports a butterfly comeback. This is encouraging news. The number of butterflies in the UK has risen to its highest level since 2019, according to conservationists. 
uh, research by the Butterfly Conservation Wildlife Charity uh, recorded uh, butterfly populations between the 14th of July and 6th of August. They saw that butterfly counts were significantly up. The Red Admiral, Admiral was the most spotted across the UK. But here's the interesting thing, uh, again, getting back to heat, periods of drought, which they experienced in 2022, they have realized, again, the whole key with butterflies is habitat. And if there's habitat loss, the butterflies suffer. They need a place to live, feed, breed, shelter, thrive. And yet another good reason to enjoy the joy of gardening and be out there planting buddleias and verbena and whatever else it may be. Lots of that. You know what? Lots of stuff. A good diversity of flowers is the best way to have butterflies. Hopefully we've inspired you with the art of enjoying your garden and hopefully you enjoy this show. We want to thank you for watching on YouTube, for listening on radio, finding our podcast, looking for us on uh, Instagram, and of course, visit our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Stacy, thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. And thanks to Adriana. Thank you, Adriana. Have a great week. <music>